Following Nintendo's early 90s tradition of putting Super in front of everything, we come to a port of 1988's RC Pro-Am, a remote-controlled car racing game. You race from an isometric perspective around 24 circuital tracks. No point-to-point -point feel nonsense here, using B to accelerate. There are three other cars racing against you, and you need to finish in any position other than last in order to progress. You can collect weapons that litter the course. There are bombs that you can place behind you that shatter opponents' vehicles if they run over them. The AI is too dumb to swerve the bombs, so if you're directly in front of one, just drop a bomb and they won't avoid it. You can also pick up missiles which you fire ahead of you. It's perhaps best not to even use the weapons against the other racers though, because if you destroy one of them more than a couple of times, they suddenly become twice as fast, and you won't catch them. You're probably better off relying on your skills to beat them fairly and avoid obstacles. Race your own race, as it were. Also scattered about the track are car parts that give a permanent power-up for all future races. Tires increase your handling, supposedly, although it's always as if you're driving on a frozen lake. Motors give a higher top speed, and batteries improve your acceleration. You can also find roll cages which make you temporarily immune to damage or spinning out. That's something that happens quite a lot. There are water and oil hazards all over the place, often conspicuously placed at the natural exit of a turn, which cause you to do a full 360 spin. Hit them on a straight section and you're not hindered, you'll just pirouette and carry on in the direction you're going. It's a pain if you're steering, though. The overall aim of the game is not only to win, but to collect in sequence the letters that spell Nintendo. Complete the octet and you get a new car, the Speed Demon. Your power-ups all reset, but this car is better anyway. You'll then need to upgrade again to the fastest car called the Spiker. You'll need to complete the word Nintendo for a third time while driving this fastest car to be considered to have completed the game. You can theoretically do this by hitting a letter on each of the 24 tracks, but it's very tricky not to miss at least one. You get three continues, though, by which you can loop the game if you need to. So long as you don't come last too much, it is doable. The graphics look pretty good, actually. They're easily as competent as the NES game with little flickering, and it's easy to distinguish your car from the others. The scenery isn't particularly interesting, but it's well done, and the 3D orientation of the cars looks great. The engine noise of the cars is impressive, but apart from the intro and race over music, there's no other songs to accompany the experience. I like some pumping music in the backgrounds of racing games, especially 8-bit ones where the race sound effects can get annoying. A really cool feature is the multiplayer mode. Each player needs their own copy of the game, sure, but this is one of the few games where you can utilize the four-player adapter. That's pretty badass, and if I only had three friends, then I wouldn't mind trying it. Never mind. Overall, Super RC Pro-Am is a blast to play, although no save or password system means you'll need some stamina for sure. The controls can be really slippery until you get to know them, but seeing as how the overall top speed is never that high, this adds a level of challenge that otherwise wouldn't be there. It's no Micro Machines, but by 1991 there weren't many better racing games on the Game Boy. Your ultimate golfing dream to win a major championship is finally at your fingertips. But getting to the top of the leaderboard will be rough, pun intended, question mark, to say the least. Your opponents are legendary, and so are the courses. But what the heck, give it your best shot. The main game mode is the tournament, which sends you around your 18-hole course in a set order. The thing is, you have to achieve a 72 par score or better on the 18 holes before being entered into the tournament proper. The whole thing takes around an hour to get through if you're thinking about every shot, so that's a lot of potential wasted time just to get into the tournament. 
You can practice holes as much as you like though, which, if you're into that sort of thing, is handy. Looking from the bird's eye perspective down onto the course, you can find all the information quite easily. Trees, bunkers, water hazards and so on are all easy to distinguish, as is the topography of the green. Gradients are indicated by arrows pointing down the slope. The player interface has clarity to it. Once an initial direction of shot is chosen, the shot screen appears, which has a smaller view of the hole, the wind speed and direction, distance to green, your choice of club, and maximum distance you're able to hit the ball with it. Choose from the usual range of clubs. The game's inbuilt caddy picks something close to the optimal one for you, but it's up to you. Then you can pick your stance. Standing with both legs the same distance from the ball attempts to hit a straight shot, but you can manipulate the left or right spin depending on which leg you put forwards or backwards. The game makes all this quite clear, and of course it's dependent on you hitting the shot properly as well. The majority of this screen is taken up by a side-on image of a golfer with a large circle around him. This shows the height of the arc of the swing with a maximum line. You have to stop the cursor at the correct strength. Letting it go further round the circle is obviously a more powerful backswing, and is also how you control front or back spin. Go past the maximum line and you'll not get as much power on your shot, it's as if you overshoot it. Upon pressing A, the cursor will spin back around the other way, and you need to stop it again within the gauge at your golfer's feet. Getting it flush in the dark line is best. Falling to the left or right hooks or slices your shot by however much you're off by. As with all golf games, it's a learning experience that you'll either be prepared to do or not. I'm no golf fan really, as someone with diplopia the game was always kind of closed off to me, it's no good trying to see two of your ball when trying to hit it, but it's a pretty dull spectacle anyway. I like golf video games though, as they're more like puzzle games than sports ones, and all have their little intricacies to learn and master. Ultra Golf, or Konami Golf as it's known here in Europe, is a very polished simulation. The graphics are great, and the physics accurate. It's a slight shame that you can only play those 18 holes, and only in that order, as it doesn't offer a huge amount of replayability. There is a save battery in the cartridge though, which records stats such as best score on particular holes, longest drives, and so on. There is a downside which it would be remiss of me to leave out. The music is not suitable for the game. It's Konami, so you know it's composed well, but it sounds like something out of Pop and Twimby or something. Totally out of place in a golf title. A very strange choice indeed. Goddess Palutena, the ruler of Angel Land, had a vivid dream of an evil force invading their beautiful world. She called the valiant warrior Pitt and sent him into a program of intense training for the upcoming attack. As the cherubim Pitt, you must find the three sacred treasures hidden in Angel Land in order to save your home. If you played the NES original, you should be right at home with the game. This feels very similar. If not, it doesn't really matter. This is a simple but ultimately very polished platform game. You jump with A and fire your bow and arrow with B. Jumping again in mid-air flaps Pitt's wings and slows his descent. There are four worlds to fight your way through, each comprising several levels. Some have you climbing cyclical towers where levels loop horizontally as you make your way to the top vertically. Others are a series of maze-like interconnected rooms that you need to puzzle out. All levels require you to get to a final door to escape. There are maps to guide you on these fortress levels, but you'll have to find them. Around the levels are these massive double doors that have several different types of room behind them. Some are shops where you can buy things like health, hammers and keys in exchange for hearts. Pot rooms have several pots to shoot, 
in which are either hearts or hammers, where the aim is to crack them all open while avoiding the one pot that has a ghost in it. Other rooms act as grinding rooms where there are a certain number of enemies, such as bats, which drop hearts. Your shooting system is pretty standard, with Pit being able to fire vertically upwards. The arrows don't fall back down on you, thankfully. At various stages in the game, you'll be granted firepower increases, and you can also acquire upgrades that kick in if you have a certain amount of health boxes filled. A similar idea to how Link's sword can fire projectiles when he has full health. One adds sinusoidal fireballs to your arrows, provided you have two blocks full. Having three health blocks gives your shots much further range, and four creates these two diamonds that orbit Pit and act as a shield, but also does damage to things. Very useful. Obviously, you need to earn these three things, and also have completed enough stages and acquired enough points that your health has increased to that level. Then, of course, you need to keep your HP up. Easier said than done. Along the way, there are plenty of things to help you do this. Enemies will sometimes drop what look like champagne flutes. These are potions that instantly heal you. These can also be found within certain destructible statues that look a little like gargoyles. It's these that you need to pick the hammers up for. Many places that appear dead ends can be smashed with hammers too to reveal hidden doorways. Within these doors, you'll occasionally find what looks like the usually dangerous poisonous water, but is actually white. This is a hot spring that instantly heals you fully. Always a welcome relief. Of course, the game is littered with opportunities to hurt yourself. Thankfully, the fall deaths from the first game were abandoned and replaced with the chance to actually retrace your steps downwards. But enemies are relentless. Acid and spikes are all over the place, and the maze-like levels culminate in particularly fierce bosses that have a ton of HP, including a minotaur that teleports randomly around the room and a serpent that flies all around firing projectiles at you. None of these are pushovers, but defeating them marks the end of the level and grants you one of the three sacred treasures. Beating the serpent, the third boss, brings you to a meeting with Palutena, who congratulates you on completing the training. Bear in mind this is about two gruelling hours into the game at this point. More than a little bit sardonic, Missy. She now lets you use the treasures, unlocking their various powers and bestowing them on you. You now have the Wings of Pegasus, which allow you to fly, a set of silver armor that halves all the damage done to Pit, and light arrows that don't disappear when hitting a target, meaning you can kill multiple enemies with them. From here, there's actually not that much of the game left, but what remains will make the first three levels actually feel like training. The final boss has two forms, the latter of which is truly menacing, bordering on the satanic. Kid Icarus's first portable outing looks and sounds very similar to the NES game, which is to say good, but never great. The soundtrack is fine, an underwhelming word to use perhaps, but honestly fine is the best way I can describe it. Good, never great, needed more. There are plenty of different enemies and these all look decent, but the backgrounds and level layouts are a little better suited to 1986 than 1991. The feel of the game is similar to the original as well, but this is a good thing. It's easier if only for the ability to go back downwards without dying, but all in all, a worthy sequel. Neketsu Koko is a series of sports releases in that Kunio-kun style that we saw with the excellent Nintendo World Cup. This is a port of the game Super Dodgeball that found its way onto quite a few different consoles in the West, but never Game Boy, sadly. You could play it on NES, TurboGrafx-16, and the Sharp X68000, as well as an arcade machine, and it has subsequently been re-released a bunch of times too, notably on the PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 4. Unfortunately, especially considering my love for the aforementioned Nintendo World Cup, once you start playing this port, it becomes clear why it never succeeded like the home console counterparts. 
There's so much going on on screen, so many characters and sprites for the Game Boy to deal with, that you can barely make out what's going on a lot of the time. It was rare that a Game Boy title suffered from any perceptible lag, but here it is very evident. Even with the inter-frame blending, the problem wasn't really rectified. It's incredibly choppy, which, in a game so reliant on fast reflexes, adds an annoying layer of difficulty playing the full 5-on-5 five -five game. The lag even affects the music, slowing it down in places that ends up being more jarring than you'd think. Fortunately, it's not all doom and gloom, thanks to a 2-on-2 format you can play. This is much smoother, as you might understand, and by golly, is it a blast to play. You already know the strengths of these Kunio-kun titles. Smooth controls, gorgeous, charming character designs, comedic animations, and so on. The backgrounds in particular are notable, very varied and with nice detail, but unfortunately this adds to the difficulty in seeing what is going on at times. The controls are quite complex, but relatively easy to pick up. You have the ability to leap in the air to get more power, and there's even a super-powered shot that will pretty much destroy anyone it hits. They aren't all going to be roaring successes, and that rings true here. It's cool they tried, and perhaps a year or two down the line, developers would have figured out how to squeeze even more out of the system, but sadly, this title was just a little too much for the Game Boy to handle. There are some parts to appreciate, but you feel the game as a whole was outside the capabilities of the system. God loves a trier, I guess. Remember Fall of the Foot Clan? Konami's Turtles 1990 tie-in was great to look at and listen to, but once the veil of nostalgia was lifted, it materialised that actually the game itself was very, very bland. Well, we have Episode 2. I'm a little annoyed by Back from the Sewers. Rarely before now has a game been hashed out in such a lacklustre way without an iota of imagination. The first game was an exercise in walking from left to right, occasionally platforming and punching or kicking the exact same enemy over and over again. Sure, you were doing it to a stunning backdrop, but once the novelty of how the game appeared vanished, it quickly became tedious and banal. It sold really well, it must be said, and because of that, the end of 1991 saw a sequel hit the shelves just in time for Christmas. The problem is the same, but amplified, if anything that if you take away the great look and sound, this game is so overtly generic as to be almost an insult. I'm going to give Konami credit, as I usually do, for making a game that is gorgeous to look at. The four characters are more detailed this time, and the backgrounds are also improved. The cutscenes are great as well, and tell a story befitting the cartoon. You've got to save April Ryan from the hands of the evil Foot Clan and defeat Shredder. You know how this goes by now. Choose between the four turtles, these act as your lives in-game. Die with a character, and they're locked out of the rest of the game. It doesn't matter which you choose, as their controls and abilities are identical. The gameplay involves walking from left to right, using whatever weapon your chosen turtle has. They're all as effective as each other. To knock these foot soldiers off the screen, usually they'll appear in a pattern of three from the right, then one from the left. Some will slide comically along the bottom, or pop out from a manhole. You repeat this for what feels like an age, until you reach the end of the segment, whereby you'll either jump to the next part, or fight a boss. The bosses don't make the game any more interesting either. They'll stand at one side of the screen, 
fire their gun for a bit, then jump over you and do the same from the other side. Little skill is needed. In fact, it's easy to overthink the boss fights when really all you need to do is stand in the right place and mash the kick button. You know what, I could go on about back from the sewers, but as the cliche goes, there's no point in flogging a dead turtle. Let's just end this review prematurely. The game looks and sounds amazing, but from a gameplay standpoint, it is without a doubt the single most beige platformer I've ever played. If you are challenged to make a game with no prior experience, you may be daunted by the prospect. You probably wouldn't know where to start. Well, I'm no expert myself, but I'd be inclined not to worry about the presentation and start with a solid idea. It doesn't have to be a complex one, as long as it's compelling to the player. That is exactly what we're offered here. The gimmick in Kada is as simple as you like and revolves around magnetism. You control what I'm assuming is a particle, or some circular mass that needs to collect all the magnetic ions on the stage. These are black, negatively charged ions, and white, positively charged ions. Your character also fluctuates between these two shades and charges. Collecting a positive charge turns or keeps your character white. Collecting a negative one turns it black. The point of this is that there are various objects around each level that are also these two shades, and these interact with you in specific ways depending on what colour you are at that time. There are arrows pointing upwards. If you are the same colour as an arrow, then these allow you to jump higher, I suppose because like poles repel. Likewise, opposite colours attract, meaning you will be pulled towards them. There are blocks that you often need to move. These are trickier at first. Being the same colour as a block causes you to push it away from you, opposite towards you. However, what's interesting is the mechanics when standing on a block. One that is the same colour as you will shoot the opposite way that you walk, and one the opposite colour will actually follow your movements, meaning if you're delicate enough you can use the block as a moving platform. Levels are timed, but not strictly so, and there are oftentimes keys and candies that increase your time. It's a good idea to pause frequently, as this stops the timer and allows you to scroll around the stage so you can plan your route. You get five lives per continue, and restarting a stage by pressing B takes a life away. You will undoubtedly need to do this a lot, as collecting the orbs in an incorrect order means you'll be stuck. In addition, once having collected everything, you need to get to the exit portal, which can often be in hard-to-reach spots meaning its position also needs to be considered when planning your route. Other things around the level as well as the two colours of orbs are ones that have both shades within. These will simply switch you to the other colour from the one you currently are. There are a few different monsters, but these don't harm you. They just bash you about rather vigorously, which can knock you to areas that leave you stuck, or just suck up your time. I mean, they launch you pretty far. There are elevators, teleporters, and crumbling platforms, as well as force fields that push you in a particular direction or can only be passed from one side. You get five lives, but it's per continue, as I say, and if you don't care too much about your score, then you can play this game indefinitely. A password is given after each level you complete, and levels are grouped in tens. You can choose any stage within the ten to tackle, and beating one fills up this silhouette of a body a little more and this anime girl's face starts to become happier. Once all 10 are conquered, you move on to the next 10. 50 levels in all with an excellent difficulty curve. Some later levels are not just about seeing what is to be done. Skill plays a huge part, especially when it comes to manipulating the blocks. They can skid all over the place. 
Also, it's far too easy to miss a delicate jump. Something as simple as that can screw you over. Sometimes the skill requirement feels just a little too precise. I much prefer the puzzle aspect as it's really unique. Still recommended. A sequel only by number, Popeye 2 is nothing like the frankly bizarre maze game that came out in Japan only in 1990. This is a side-scrolling 2D platform affair where you're running, jumping, punching, all the usual tropes. A jumps, B punches, and you can hold B to run. Similar to a Mario experience in a lot of ways, you'll need to be running to make certain jumps. The difference here is that B makes you punch as well. You don't jump on enemies' heads. It wouldn't be a Popeye game without cans of spinach, of course, despite the fact that fresh spinach is considerably better for you than the canned stuff, but whatever. Here, collecting the cans increases your power bar at the top left corner of the screen. You start with three. If you manage to collect five, then your punching arm gets much bigger. Get seven, and you gain the ability to hurl cans of spinach at enemies. Any damage you take causes you to lose one of the cans. If you run out entirely, then you die. But it does mean that as long as you keep finding them, you can just carry on. These are largely found from punching through destroyable blocks. They fly vertically upwards and down pretty quickly though, so you'll no doubt miss as many as you manage to catch. The problem comes if you die on a boss. If you're well powered up, this shouldn't happen, but if it does, you unfortunately have to start right at the boss, at minimum power. This of course means that a tough fight just became that much tougher and you can expect to lose life after life as you can't go back to power up. There are time limits per stage. You can collect increases, and also there are loads of coins scattered around. Gather a hundred coins and you get an extra life. Sound familiar? You are largely moving from left to right, but also there are plenty of secrets that require you to jump upwards or travel back on yourself, onto clouds and treetops and such. You might get a six golden coins feel to it rather than the first Mario Land, but bear in mind that this game came out before that one. Graphically, this game has a humorous edge to it, consistent with what was a really weird looking cartoon. I mean, how do you get forearms that large while still having skeletal upper arms? And the music and sound effects are excellently executed. The controls are nice and responsive, although it can be a little tricky to pull off a running punch at first, seeing as how both moves are controlled by the same button. You have to release and quickly press B again. You'll get it. Ropes can be a challenge to use at times. Jumping off them is not too sharp, but by and large the controls are totally fair and not that frustrating. Platform hit detection is really generous. Again, there's little frustration there. If you fall, it's probably due to your own lack of skill. Zero points for originality, this is a Super Mario ripoff, let's be completely honest, but hey, if you're gonna clone something, at least clone the best, right? Oh, and speaking of originality, I forgot to mention the innovative page-turner that is the storyline, Bluto's kidnapped olive oil. That took at least five seconds to come up with.
Back to the Super Chinese Land universe we go with this one, revisiting video gaming's third most popular Ryu and his friend Jack. Ninja Boy 2 features the same characters as the first game, but thankfully, you may say, the gameplay is totally different. Where that one was a top-down attempt at a beat-em-up, this is actually an RPG, and it's not bad. Jack and Ryu are enjoying a pleasant space flight with their friends. All of a sudden, space pirates come into view. We're the warriors of the galaxy, they exclaim. You'll be removed from our way by force. Your buddies dive into a life capsule and quickly escape, just as the space pirates fire a rocket at your ship. You, as Jack, and your friend Ryu crash land on a planet. The name of the game is to first of all figure out where you are. Once that's done, you realize the nefarious schemes of the pirates. These invaders have kidnapped all of these dignitaries from a vital intergalactic conference. You need to help the people of Futureland defeat these evil overlords by visiting several planets, rebuilding your ship, and taking them down. The usual tropes are all there. You walk around a town, buying equipment and talking to townsfolk. When you are thrown into a random encounter in the overworld, you have the option to bout or run. Run doesn't always work, it depends on your level relative to the enemy. Bout starts you off in this fighting scene, where you'll have a small group of monsters called Gallons to fight. The battle scenes are not dissimilar to the first game, actually. Graphically, it's definitely better. Less childish, a bit more professional, and you can tell what things are. I say that, although the face a sprite pulls when it gets punched looks borderline ridiculous. The hit detection is improved, and takes place in more of a beat-em-up style, sideways on rather than the top-down effect the first game went for. There's little finesse to the combat. You press A to throw a punch and jump with B. You can double tap to run. The gallons sometimes pick you up above their head and throw you down. You can jump off sometimes, mash A until it works, but make sure you jump to the side or they'll just catch you again like you are an acrobatics team. B and up does a high kick, and there are a few other moves you can pull off. However, these special kicks take something called M power to be able to use. Punch the blocks to regain health, or find these tokens with an M on, which give you a bit of this power as indicated in the bottom right. Your usual fighting sequences aside, the boss battles aren't like that. These are more traditional, where you have to cast spells and perform turn-based attacks, that sort of thing. Obviously, your level comes into account much more here, so be sure to have trained up outside of the boss fights. Graphically, Ninja Boy 2 is more refined, although it'll still never win any awards. The music is a gigantic improvement though, I have to say. There's still the odd choice of 8-bar blues in places, but at least it's put together well, and the variation is way better. I'm not sure about the translation skills in places. Sure, it's always understandable, but often the dialogue between characters doesn't quite sound like the way an English speaker would phrase things. Welcome to my store. The fee is 60 sen. Do you want a ride on camel? Or, we are a little strange but nice. You sure are, propeller arms lady. Whether I'd want to play Ninja Boy 2 through to completion, I'm not sure. A mid-tier RPG that at least showed a desire to be a halfway decent game. Don't expect to be blown away, but also don't be put off by how bad the first game was, as this is not the same. A franchise better known perhaps to European gamers is Manfred Trenz's brainchild, Turrican. Originally on Commodore 64, but ported to lots of different home computers and consoles, the game spawned several sequels as well, and is particularly memorable for its amazing soundtracks. 
The first Turrican game on the Game Boy was developed by the Code Monkeys, responsible for the Mega Drive and PC Engine versions as well. The Lost Colony of Altera, not the one from the Aretha franchise I don't think, is a man-made life world abandoned long ago, which was created to house humanity after they presumably rendered original Terra inhospitable. Yeah, we'll do that. Anyway, these life worlds are bioengineered by a powerful ecosystem generation network known as Morgul. However, a cataclysmic quake severed all system interface functions, and Morgul murderously rebelled. The few colonists lucky enough to escape told a grim tale of a higher intelligence gone berserk. For generations, mankind sought a return to Altera. Finally, genetic science created a savior, Turrican a mutant warrior made for the task of planetary reclamation. As Turrican, you must eliminate the twisted Alteran lifeforms from all five worlds, and finally destroy the three faces of Morgul. It's a hell of a storyline, and the first two games played a huge part in cultivating my love for video games in the early 90s. I had them both on the Amiga home computer that inexplicably didn't catch on in the US. It was way more competent a system, and had an arguably stronger library than any home console of the time. Such vivid colours, awesome joystick-powered gameplay, and two of the greatest video game soundtracks ever made. Especially Turrican 2 The Final Fight, by Chris Hulsbeck. However, we're not here to nostalgize about the Amiga, even though I could do that for days. We're here to see if the Game Boy port is any good. I'm strangely not so confident. It seems too big of an ask to put such a large project onto a system considerably less powerful than the computers it was originally intended for. The game is heavily weighted towards platforming, but you can rarely stop blasting away at stuff for a second. Turrican is always hard, always unforgiving. You jump with A and fire your current weapon with B. Scattered throughout the levels are collectibles that switch between the normal and laser weapons. Holding down B kicks out a lightning whip, which you can fire right the way around you indefinitely. It's pretty powerful actually, although you can't move while firing it. There are also three special weapons that you can use. Grenades can be shot out, destroying most enemies that it blasts through. You can also detonate them against a wall, which shakes the screen and wipes out anything that you can currently see. Press select once to choose them. Throwing a grenade reverts you back to the regular weapon. Pressing select twice and then the fire button sends two strong vertical waves of energy across the screen. These are best saved for boss battles. Press and hold down to plant a mine. These have a similar effect to the grenades by killing everything on screen. You can drop down into a Morph Ball-esque spiked ball, which makes you invulnerable and can plow through ground-based enemies. You can still fire your weapons in this buzzsaw mode, usually you can only plant bombs, but it can only be used three times per life, which is weird as it's always been infinite on every other iteration. As well as the diamonds that you can accumulate for points, you'll find lots of power-ups, they're everywhere. If you see a large floating block that looks kind of out of place, shoot at it and it'll spew forth a ton of collectibles. P-blocks restore your whole energy bar. The diamond one is actually a very useful shield that surrounds you for 30 seconds or so. What looks like a waveform gives you the laser, and there's one that improves your basic weapon. You can replenish all your special weapons too, but what's most useful, and thankfully copious throughout, are one-ups. It's not hard to die in this game, and you only get three continues, although you can exchange 400 diamonds for another one, so any extra lives are welcome. I was most apprehensive that the music in-game wouldn't be up to the same high standards, but actually my worry was misguided. The tunes are definitely recognisable from the first Turrican game, and done as well as they could have been on the Game Boy. Not a bad effort, but I would have held back on the sound effects because they override the music too much at times, leaving something not as audibly pleasing as it could be. On a few levels there's no music at all, which is conspicuous by its absence for sure. What does really impress though is the visuals. I was anticipating, and ready to accept, a really basic, slimline version of graphics, but everything is drawn really well actually. The backgrounds have the right atmosphere about them, and it's obvious what sprites are what, even though they're quite small. The screen wipes are excellent, 
and there are little animations such as the explosions and water splashes that are really cool. It's also impressive just how little flickering or slowdown there is, even when using the lightning whip that takes up a lot of animation frames. The user interface at the bottom probably didn't need to be as large as it is, at least a third of the screen is taken up with your timer, energy and weapons. That's normal for Turrican, yes, but it wouldn't have hurt to go against tradition with the smaller screen. The most important factor for whether a port is successful, however, is whether or not the game feels right. Turrican needs to be brutal, relentless and stressful, but also imaginative, responsive and ever-changing. This version ticks all of those boxes for me. The game is huge, 10 levels all told, each one different from the last. There are lots of tricks and techniques to master, and you will need to, because this game is as goddamn hard as it should be. But it's always fair, and you absolutely cannot ask any more than that. Sure, it's not perfect, but the achievement of getting a game as complex as Turrican onto the Game Boy and have it be as good as this is frankly bloody astounding. Did you ever play the NES version of this movie game? It was, frankly, horrible. There, you played as Eddie Valiant and had to gather together pieces of Acme's will. The Game Boy version is entirely different. For one thing, you're controlling Roger Rabbit himself, and there's none of that ridiculous driving gimmick. A lot of the characters are there, and certain places and storyline events will be recognisable to anyone who's seen the film, but I'd say a good three quarters of the game is a bit different. Of course, Jessica would have to be kidnapped by the Weasels. It's a Game Boy game after all. You need to go see Eddie Valiant to help you find her again. There are lots of discrepancies between this game and the movie, but they're largely superficial. Baby Herman seems to be acting as Valiant's secretary. Marvin gets murdered right at the start of the story. Eddie Valiant doesn't take a single drink. There are a lot of differences. It doesn't really matter, though. The storyboard is plenty charming enough, with some delightful humour in the dialogue that you can really imagine being voiced by Bob Hoskins and whoever it was who did Roger's voice. The game plays out through six scenes, with a lot of storytelling throughout. This is possibly the largest text-to-game ratio that there's been so far, but it's all to the game's benefit. The whole thing takes place in a non-linear overworld that you can freely explore. You're wandering around LA and Toontown, following clues given to you by various NPCs, looking for the next building to go in or weapon to find. The weapons from the movie are all there. The extendable boxing glove thing, the toon gun, and so on. It does feel a little like you're aimlessly wandering around sometimes, but as with all games like this, when things seem a little cryptic, just try everything. Be wary that you have a health meter, though, three hearts that are replenishable by finding carrots. Lose all your health, and you'll have to start again from the beginning of whatever scene you were on. Carrots are plentiful, but a lot of the screens in-game involve trying to sneak past weasels that patrol the streets, or pop out of manholes and the like. You can hide behind things or duck using A. They're hardly intelligent, but then they weren't in the movie either. If you're lost and find yourself backtracking, though, you'll have to manoeuvre them each time you enter a screen and can find your health dwindling pretty quickly if you're not careful. The music isn't taken from the movie that I can tell, and while it is a bit repetitive, it has a kind of film noir style that fits the time period. It's certainly a vast improvement on the five or six bars that repeated right the way through the NES game. And graphically, it's excellent, actually. I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way quite the opposite. The gameplay is this title's biggest problem. 
To travel between two areas, you have to undergo a minute-long ride on the streetcar. Each time you want to go to or from Sunset Boulevard, you have to watch this whole journey. You can't skip it. For what is aspiring to be an adventure game, there's little rhyme or reason to any of the puzzle solutions. You basically just wander around until you put a certain peg in the right hole. For a first playthrough, this can be really frustrating and a little dull in all honesty. For a repeated playthrough, well, there's not a great deal of reason to play it again once you've beaten the game. If you buy this, I wouldn't consider it a waste of money, and if you're blessed with enough patience, then it wouldn't be a waste of time either. Who Framed Roger Rabbit isn't what I'd call a good game, though. It's better than that dip LJN put out, at least. After the plans of the nefarious space pirates were thwarted in the first Metroid game, it befell the Galactic Federation to ensure this newfound life form could never again be manipulated. They sent several teams to SR388 to ensure the aliens were forever destroyed. Of course, all squads deployed didn't return, so they turned instead to the original savior, one Samus Aran. While exploring SR388, Samus finds that indeed the Metroids have begun to repopulate. Not only that, but they've started mutating into bigger and badder forms. From small, jellyfish-like creatures to large, lizard-like beasts. Now, I don't want to ruin the storyline for you because it really is a good one. I'll just say that the ending of this game leads perfectly into Super Metroid that would come in 1994 on the Super Nintendo. Overall, it might well be the most pivotal plot in the franchise, as it not only gives more credence to what happened in the first game, but also sets up the culminating events in Metroid Fusion. Players of any of the old-school-style Metroid games, i.e. not the Metroid Prime ones, will be familiar with this style. It's a platform shooter with a handful of RPG and semi-linear adventure elements. The word Metroidvania is used as a subgenre these days, but originally referred to later Castlevania games that were done in this Metroid style. For those unfamiliar, we're talking from the PS1 game Symphony of the Night and their Game Boy Advance DS games such as Harmony of Dissonance and Circle of the Moon. Go back earlier than those to 1987 when the original Metroid was released, and you have one of the earliest interpretations of the idea. This game took the established platforming game idea and added this element of discovery to it. Not only are you running, jumping and shooting, but you also have to find your way around a labyrinthine area. I don't want to call it non-linear, really, because there is a certain path through these games that you need to follow with not a great deal of deviation. You often can't access certain parts until earlier sections have been beaten and a power-up of some kind collected. You jump with A and fire with B, but there's a slight intricacy to your jumping that you may not figure out straight away. It's very helpful to know about it though, and your movement is greatly benefited by it. If you press jump and a direction simultaneously, or while holding a direction, Samus will perform her famous somersault jump. This becomes useful when you have the spring ball and screw attack power-ups later on, as this is how you activate them. The problem with this jump is that your forward momentum continues until you land, which can make landing on narrow platforms tricky. If delicate, accurate jumps are needed, jump and then press a direction after. Samus won't do her flippy thing and is much more controllable in the air this way. There is an assortment of weapons throughout the game, a sinusoidal shot, an ice beam and a triple shot amongst others. You find them periodically through the game as orbs held up by these Chozo statues, called Artifactor statues in this game. They all have infinite ammo, but you can't carry them all around with you. If you want to switch back to an earlier weapon, you'll need to return to the statue where you found it and pick it up. I probably wouldn't worry about it though, as each weapon you come across is an improvement on the last, and only right at the end of the game is it beneficial to change back. 
Without spoiling the ending, there's a particularly vicious enemy in the final area that it's useful to freeze just before firing missiles at, so you need the ice beam back. Fortunately, just before you enter this section, the game gives you one anyway, so it's implied that you'll need it soon. If you're familiar with other Metroid games, you'll no doubt remember the doors that you need to fire missiles at, or some other weapon, in order to open and progress. You're not on a space station or anything like that, you're in the bowels of a planet, with the only construct being those of a ruined city. So your path is instead blocked and dictated by lava. You need to kill a certain number of Metroids in each section. You can see how many by pausing the game, and the number in the bottom right changes. After which, an earthquake or rumbling will occur, and the lava will recede, allowing you to progress deeper into SR388's heart. There's a kind of central hub where the lava is. If the main song of the game is playing, then that's where you are, and the sections all pretty much branch off from it. So, while you still don't have a map, Super Metroid on the SNES was the first in the series to feature a navigation screen. This game is more easily navigable than the original. If you're stuck where to go next, you can just return along the path you're on until the main theme starts up again, and you won't be far off. Just head downwards. The game has a battery in it, still quite a rarity at this point in time, and you can save three different adventures. You can't cheese this, though. You need to find a short column in-game and press Start. They're sparsely spread out, I think there's only five or six in the whole game. If you die, you need to restart at the last point you saved. Metroid 2 bucked a convention that had unwittingly been established by this point. It had mostly dark backgrounds. A lot of earlier games strayed away from this because of the potential for screen blurring, but Metroid 2 really made it work, and it adds to the ominous, gloomy atmosphere. Sure, the backgrounds don't have a ton of variation in them, but the enemies sure do, and all look great. The mutation sequences of the Metroids are cool as hell, and the environment is easily identifiable, which is, in all honesty, a massive achievement. Also, with the development of the Game Boy Color, some seven years later, a special Metroid 2 palette was programmed into it, which helps this game resemble that of the NES original. Quite something. This game divides opinion for some reason. It seems that fans of the original game like it as more of the same, but other, more retrospective players sometimes cite the cut-back approach taken in comparison to Super Metroid. I hate comparing Game Boy games to their home console equivalents, especially when they're not contemporaries of each other, as they're totally different mediums with different requirements and objectives. The fact of the matter is that there's nothing else like this on the Game Boy, and we are so lucky that it exists, because if you base the game on the host system and its capabilities, you'll realise that Metroid 2 is a phenomenal accomplishment. Painting by numbers isn't really a good thing when it comes to creating intellectual property. It basically means you're following a formula laid out by someone else because you've no skill to create the piece yourself. These were a short-lived company who were involved with a number of Robocop 2 games, as well as a game called Hook for the Game Boy. They developed games solely for Ocean Software, which is surely why they inevitably went under. I'm always a little wary when you see Ocean related to a game, but let's not allow bias to creep into this. Similar to the 1990 first Robocop game, this is a walk-and-gun platformer. The FPS-style mini-levels aren't present here, though. The focus was much more towards the platforming side of things. 
you have a lot of jumping to do. Kind of strange for a character that has trouble with a simple staircase to have to jump a lot. Robocop's not exactly renowned for his athletic ability in any of the movies. In the first game, you can angle your gun horizontally, diagonally, or vertically, playing to Robocop's shtick of being really good at aiming. For some reason here, they thought it'd be more suitable to only allow the player to shoot forwards. You can only shoot two bullets at a time, not one or more than two, and there's a really distracting delay where it seems your inputs have been swallowed. This makes the whole shooting part of the game really unsatisfying. A really annoying feature is your ducking mechanism. You can duck, sure, but enemy fire is kind of at waist height, meaning that even if you do duck in time, the bullet hits you anyway. It's as if Robocop decided to deflect the shot with his face instead of his abdomen. The enemy variation is poor. Well, actually, it doesn't exist. They're all the same. There is an inexhaustible army of grunt guys. Some pop out of windows or a hole in the ground, but the majority just walk back and forth aimlessly. You will have to arrest a certain amount of these hostage takers per stage, so don't shoot everything. But honestly, you don't really need to shoot anything. Because you dodge bullets with the agility of a 400 pound man, you'll do a better job of surviving if you try to jump over everyone. Take the guys in the windows, for instance. Nothing in the game is geared towards making these guys hittable. You can't shoot diagonally or upwards, so you need to jump and shoot. Well, of course, the input delay is such a pain that being able to time this to coincide with the couple of frames that they're on screen means you're seriously better off just ignoring them. They're no threat unless you stand still in their line of fire anyway. For a shooter game, this is a hell of a lot of two sides not killing each other. Between levels, you sometimes have one of those slide puzzle things where there's a scrambled up picture in pieces and you have to move them about to recreate the original. It's timed, but don't worry about it. Whether or not you complete it has no bearing on anything. No bonus points, no extra lives, no nothing. If you fail, you don't lose a life. I cannot see the point of this being in the game. There are other weapons to collect, but they're not a massive improvement, really. You get a spread shotgun, which has such poor animation that it really highlights the slapdash nature of everything going on here. The graphics are idiotic, the hit detection frequently inaccurate, especially with certain platforms that you just fall through. The design choice of needing to jump so much, kind of baffling. There's just a whole lack of effort with Robocop 2. It's as if they were like, Ah, oh, crap, there's a Robocop 2? Why did nobody say anything? Quick, slap some code together. Don't waste time on the graphics or the gameplay. Just get it out there, damn it. Absolute garbage from start to, well, about five minutes in. You won't want to go any further, trust me. One of those names that set my modern day, not sure you can say that, alarm bell ringing is Gremlin Graphics' first Game Boy outing. This is quite a unique puzzler for the system, which is always quite refreshing to find amidst the succoban and block puzzle masses. In Brain Bender, you have on each 9x9 grid a laser somewhere that emits a continuous beam of light. You need to manipulate this beam, Raiders of the Lost Ark style, over rotatable mirrors, through filters and such, in order to pop all the balloons or balls, illuminate light bulbs, and then finally guide the light onto a star shape, all within a time limit. All the mirrors are oriented around a center point and can be aligned at many angles between horizontal and vertical. You move a cursor onto a particular mirror and press A to rotate clockwise, B anti-clockwise. Getting this alignment perfect can be a little tricky as the movement is very sensitive and precise. To pop a ball, you just need to fire the laser through it one time. It doesn't need to be a constant stream. Similarly, you can light a bulb by simply shining the laser on it once. 
Light can also be reflected from certain mirror walls, bouncing symmetrically off them. The filters don't reflect light, but need to be aligned in such a way that the beam can pass through them unhindered. Some have a single path through, others a cross shape that need to be used twice. The timer can be pretty harsh, and this is exacerbated by the risk of firing the beam back at the light source. Do this, and your energy dwindles rapidly, causing a failure. It's quite useful to alter the mirror closest to the light source last, making sure that you don't have a double back somewhere, and then finally sending the light on its course. There are walls on some levels that can only be passed through at a perfect perpendicular angle, meaning there's usually only one solution to these stages. Later on features mirrors that cannot be altered, black holes that suck up your time, and even blocks that move when light hits them. These are a nightmare. The graphics are as basic as they come, but that's not a bad thing here. You want a game like this to be clear and easy to visualise, and that was certainly achieved. That doesn't mean you'll always be able to see exactly what's going to happen, unless you can bend your brain enough. A solution often doesn't play out exactly how I imagine it will, which is more of an indictment of my own mental capacity rather than how the game works. The angles are always correct. Trial and error can be utilised if you want, but the further into the game you get, the less it'll pay off as there are more and more ways to reflect the laser back at the source, which you don't want to do. The music's a little dull, and it might benefit you to turn it off anyway so you can more clearly hear the buzzing that happens when you're taking damage and quickly respond to it. You can usually just turn one mirror slightly and it'll throw the beam entirely off, but can still be quite frantic when it happens. All in all, Brainbender, or Migraine as it was called in Japan, fitting really, is a clever but simple game with a unique premise that is actually pretty addictive. The 120 levels are split up into 12 groups of 10, with each chapter being password accessible. It's one of those that I'll probably never finish, but don't mind giving it a go every now and then. Not bad at all. Pretty much the only pair of Christmas movies that I can bear to sit through each year, for family tradition's sake more than anything, is the first two Home Alone flicks, with everyone's favourite grumpy preteen Kevin being mistakenly left alone at Christmas by his idiot parents and having to defend his family's mansion from two dimwit crooks, Harry and Marv. I'll admit, the slapstick is still pretty funny. Daniel Stern in particular can really sell getting hit in the forehead with a brick, and seeing as how it was a massively grossing franchise, it makes a certain kind of sense from a marketing perspective to make a video game about it. So anyway, the whole bit about Kevin being left at home on his own was glossed over in this game. We cut straight to the two burglars who have busted out of prison and are now after the McAllister's VCRs and toys. You play as Kevin and have to find a certain amount of your family's treasures before the bad guys do. These can be in plain sight, or hidden in dresses, drawers, refrigerators, toilets, and so on. You then outwit the morons by hiding them in the basement by way of a laundry chute. It's a good job none of these prized possessions are fragile, because they end up plummeting downwards into a Scrooge McDuck-esque pile of wealth. You wander around four wings of this grotesquely immense mansion the McAllisters live in, trying to find things from jewellery and trophies to electronics and even pets. Yes, the wet bandits apparently want to steal your kitties. 
I don't want to get into the ethics of stuffing a dog down a laundry chute, so put it down to artistic license, okay? Strolling around your house are a whole host of bad guys. It's not just Harry and Marv. If any of them touch you, you'll lose a health point, of which you start with three. They can be replenished by finding pizza. You're not completely defenseless. You carry a water pistol with infinite ammo. I don't want to think about how he's refilling it, which for some reason can take down fully grown men. You have to fire at them a ton of times, and they'll likely cause you damage before you manage to fell them, so you're probably best jumping over them. There are also finite amounts of ammo for a slingshot, a BB gun, and a couple of other things. There are also some pranks that you can play on some screens. A bowling ball is inexplicably stored on a shelf in a house full of kids, which is just asking for trouble, and you can knock it off. It'll crash to the floor, shaking the whole room, which causes an ornament to fall from a different shelf onto some guy who watched you do the whole thing. There are others as well, but none of them are particularly funny, and suspending your disbelief is even harder here than it was while watching the actual films. Not content with piling his inheritance up in the basement, when the quota has been reached, Kevin wisely decides to go stash everything he saved in the safe. So you have to find the key to the basement. Down there, it's not safe, however. This is where the bosses live. The bosses are daft, a couple of which play on some of the things that Kevin shows fear of in the films. The first boss is a giant tarantula that you need to kill by knocking bricks down onto it. There's a rat and a ghost, culminating in the wet bandits themselves. Well, actually, you for some reason have to then fight the furnace thing after that. You just fire your water pistol at it enough times to extinguish the flames. Graphically, the pictures do kinda look like the characters if you squint a little. The John Williams music is kind of there, if you squint your ears somewhat, or whatever the equivalent is, but as the overall game is to the movie, each aspect is a shoddy representation of what it should be. The gameplay is where Home Alone really struggles, though. You often ghost right through objects, leading to you taking damage while trying to pick something up. The movement is so slippery that it can take a quarter of a screen for Kevin's momentum to stop. The films are most famous for the pranks and spots, and while you think to yourself, I can't believe they fell for that, the flow between spots is smooth and still quite believable, considering the relative IQs of the two baddies. Here, they mostly don't exist, and when they do, they're just dumb, with a crook conveniently stood in the exact worst place they could be, just waiting for you to trigger the trap. Anyway, the whole premise of the story was to stop the goons, not let them in and just hide all your stuff. Just a silly, silly game, with as much appeal as a plain cheese pizza. School's out, and Bart's ready for some summer fun in the sun. Until he got the news, Homer and Marge were sending him and Lisa off to summer camp. Not just any camp, but the infamous Camp Deadly. How bad could it be? Well, with Iron Fist Burns as head counselor, and Nelson and his band of bullies as bunkmates, it's not exactly paradise. Bart and Lisa are determined to get out, but first they've got to survive the food fights, killer bees, and a life-threatening game of Capture the Flag. So, it's 1991. Simpsons the cartoon is arguably at its peak. It's hard to imagine any other TV series being so popular for so long, but even as long ago as this, it was a huge enough phenomenon to warrant many, many video games on lots of different systems. Sadly, they were mostly average at best, horrific at worst, imparting a minimal amount of the license's qualities and undeniable quirky humour. The first of the Game Boy titles was made by Bart vs. the Space Mutants slash World creators Imagineering, and features Bart trying to break out of a horrendous summer camp, reminiscent of the classic episode Camp Krusty. 
It's not the clown in charge, but Mr. Burns' hitherto unheard of nephew, Iron Fist Burns, a man who, quote, inherited his good looks. You have several different gameplay modes to make your way through. First up, you have to journey through the woods, finding several flags, while trying to avoid the onslaught of counsellors running at you. You can fire spit wads at them, which incapacitates them for a bit, or Lisa will give you a handful of boomerangs, which are better. These fly back at you, and if you can catch them, you can reuse them, otherwise they're gone. The morons keep coming at you indefinitely, it seems, but if you stand still as soon as you see one, then they don't tend to gang up on you as much. There are killer bees that are pretty fierce, but Lisa, who has somehow got ahead of you at this point, gives you Bumblebee Man's suit, which calms them down. You fight some bosses, and then some other things happen that don't make much sense, then it's lunchtime. In the mess tent, you basically walk to the right, throwing various rancid-sounding food like tofu burgers and liver pizza at the counsellors. Then it's more flag capturing, and then you have to climb a mountain that's in the camp for some reason. I didn't get any further than this because it was at this point I started to question whether I even liked The Simpsons at all. I know a lot of games focus heavily on starting on the left side of a stage and finishing on the right, but there's literally nothing else in a lot of these levels. You might have to climb a tree or jump over a pit occasionally, but this is so noticeably the only mechanic that it becomes painful after a while. The controls do what they should for the most part, although it's hard to jump onto a branch from a tree trunk sometimes. The off-the-wall humour that makes the show so popular is missing almost entirely from this game. The funniest part of it is the manual, which was definitely not written by any of the writers from the show. Eh, maybe the Family Guy writers. The graphics are alright, although the animation leaves plenty to be desired. You'd think it would be right up there, but hey. The memorable theme music is the only song in the game, and it wasn't exactly note perfect, and is kind of actually really annoying after about three minutes. Space was clearly saved for the digitised voice of Bart saying, Eat my shorts, every freaking time he gets hit. It's pretty clear as far as Game Boy digitised sounds go, not saying much, but I still wouldn't have done it. There are another two Bart headlining Simpsons titles on the original Game Boy. We'd also see an itchy and scratchy golf one and Krusty's Funhouse, as well as the Treehouse of Horror game on the Game Boy Color, which was actually quite good. But I don't hold out a lot of hope. Also, why did Bart get all three? Homer is by far the funniest character. I'm not going to claim any old-school points for this, but Battletoads on the NES was unjustifiably difficult. It's beatable, I've seen people do it, but honestly it's something I'll never achieve because there are parts that are so soul-destroying that I feel a little lessened by the whole experience. Anyway, despite whether it's become so famous these days through memes or some other such notoriety, it's objectively not really that special of a game. The best, and also worst, part of that game was the two-player mode, even if just so you can twat your mate around for a bit. I don't think the game's beatable as two-player, there's supposedly a glitch that stops you doing so, but it was definitely more enjoyable than playing on your own. The Game Boy version did away with this, despite the link cable capabilities, and as a result the storyline had to be slightly altered. You can no longer choose between the three characters, but instead control their intrepid leader Zitz, the most boring one, and of course you have to rescue the other two. The first level looks pretty familiar as you're trying not to fall off a cliff top while punching hogs and hands with billy clubs. The camera action is something quite noticeable, as you can quite often have to go over to the right-hand side of the screen a fair way to get it to move, but the way it does is quite fluid feeling. That's the best way I can describe it. 
The fighting stages are usually the strongest part of any Battletoads game, and the lack of them was a large part of what the NES game suffered from. Too many silly platforming and speed tunnel levels where rote learning and quick reflexes were more important than being able to stomp ass. The Game Boy version has those, but to a lesser extent, and the game is stronger for it. The controls are really good in these brawl levels, with responsive and fair movement and the ability to do a proper jumping attack. This move really is the key to getting anywhere, as a lot of enemies don't seem to have an answer to it. As mentioned, there are the occasional speed tunnel levels, but they're nowhere near as brutal. You get a visual hint of what's coming up in terms of obstacles in a reasonable amount of time. And there's none of this having to connect exactly correctly with ramps or anything like that. Oh, you'll still die quite a bit, I'm sure, but it's actually doable. None of that despair of thinking that you'll never make it. The speed sections aren't as long, and they're usually found in between shoot'em up sections. The graphics are incredible for a Game Boy game, with the hilariously exaggerated fists and boots while fighting, and Zits can grow a pair of ram's horns to do a charge attack. The pictures in between stages are right out of a comic book. Some of the bosses look legitimately menacing in these images, and are actually mirrored in-game, which often is not the case. Of course, the music is as good as any Battletoads title, which is to say it's excellent. Heavy, fast, catchy, everything you want to match the 90s radical attitude of the era. There's a pretty annoying section, I think it's level 5, where you're running down these twisty diagonal passages away from this massive boulder that looks like a brain. It's tough as nails, you have to stay out of its reach for a good couple of minutes with not a lot of response time. It's kind of a buzz killer, just when you thought they weren't going to include a stupid level like that. If you can make it through, then you're onto another Battletoad staple, abseiling a deep vertical chasm avoiding spikes and eagles and rats on balloons. It's not that long a level, thankfully, and once you reach the foot, you fight this grotesquely obese rat with a mohawk. It's quite tricky, but the game doesn't let up. A nightmarish platforming stage with rotating scythe things is followed up with a firefight with Robo Manus, which involves Zits strapped to a jetpack, blasting upwards through a mechanical hallway, firing rockets at anything and everything, until you come to a door. The hardest thing about this stage is the very strict time limit. Get to the door, and you're on to the final boss battle. I'm not going to ruin it for anyone skilled enough to get this far, suffice to say that it will hurt you. You can do it, I promise. I gotta admit, I'm really getting into these golf games, because it's not really sport, is it? Especially in video game form, it's really more of a skill or even a puzzle game if you think about it. Here's one you might not have heard of before. Honestly, I'd seen the title in my master list, but until I played it, I thought it was a compilation of Namco games, but then they were called Namco Gallery. More on those later. The holes here are often horizontal on the screen, instead of the traditional playing upwards style, and each hole is accompanied by a really cool scrolling preview. But you can also scroll all around it by pressing B at any time, so you can plan your shots out. You choose between stroke play, you're just trying to beat the course score, and a tournament where other players are involved. There's also a two-player mode, but unfortunately this requires the link cable. Dunno why, as it's not like you're playing simultaneously, golf is typically turn-based. At the start of your game, you can choose your handicap. The higher, the easier your game will be. And select five clubs to take with you. A couple of realisms that you don't often get. It's not immediately obvious what the controls are, you have to press up and down to select your clubs, but it only works before you press anything else. Once the shot selection starts, up and down, choose the spin you put on the ball. It's a little clunky at first, but you'll get used to it. Everything you'd expect from a golf game is there, and the physics are pretty solid. It's hard to get super excited about Namco Classic because of how many of its contemporaries are as good as they are, but I enjoyed this enough for what it is. 
Nothing flashy, just a solid golf simulation that got lost in the shuffle a little bit. Apparently dodgeball is a rather large deal in Japan. Who knew, right? At least if the number of Game Boy games is anything to go by. Make your way through death matches or a tournament against many different opponents of increasing skill. You can choose three types of court, a gymnasium, a clay court, and a beach. Is it anything more than an aesthetic choice? Not as such, no. You pick six team members, three who are restrained to one half of the court, and three others who stand around the outside of the opponent's half. You can pass to a teammate with A and throw a shot at the other guys using B. The aim is to defend the three members actually on the court by taking down the ones from the other team. The problem is that the playfield is aligned in such a way that you can't see the other players. The camera is focused solely on the area where the ball is. Pass to your teammates surrounding the other half and you can see. As you might predict, the other team aren't hampered by this because that would be fair. They'll hit you from anywhere, and of course you can't see your own players when they're attacking because they're not on screen, leaving you no time to actually dodge. Your three vulnerable players are not immediately knocked out if they get hit, instead they all have a health bar that dwindles based on how hard they're hit. If this reaches zero, they're out. It's possible to properly destroy the other team by hitting a power shot, although whether this actually happens is a little sporadic. Maybe I'm doing the button combos wrong. The animations when a player gets hit are pretty funny, and the gameplay feels pretty smooth. It's a step up from the previous dodgeball game we reviewed recently, Niketsu Koko Dodgeball Boo, which really suffered from trying to do too much graphically. There's no slowdown or flicker from having too many characters on screen, However, I find myself asking whether we should have to choose between slowdown and actually being able to see both teams at once. It seems a weird question to have to ask in this day and age, but back then apparently you did. Mercenary Force introduced us to Lenar, a development team who clearly had an eye for taking an established genre and titivating it up a bit to create a game that is recommendable but certainly not intuitive. One of those traits carries over to this Japanese exclusive, and I'll let you, dear reader, decide which I mean. Battle of Kingdom defies any obvious classification as Based on its avatar, it appears to live smack bang in the middle of the role-playing genre. You have a bunch of your standard fantasy characters to control, each with their own stats, strengths and weaknesses, with whom you're essentially trying to defend your kingdom from the onrushing forces of an evil one. However, there's no overworld, dungeons or towns or anything of that nature to explore. Instead, progression is done via moving spaces on a board. However, you don't roll a die or anything, you simply move one space at a time with no random encounters, chance cards or anything like that. So it's not really a board game either. There is also an element of a strategy game in place. You need to spend your coffers on various monsters, each of which has a unique move, usually a strong damaging attack, although not always. The stronger ones are obviously more expensive, but the weaker ones will die even when against an enemy that is identical to it, so you do need them. The weaker enemies are quickly useless due to this imbalance, 
to the point where there's not really any strategy to speak of. The battle system, such as it is, takes place on a wide expanse of terrain. You start on the extreme left of this, while the enemy starts on the right. You need to choose between five commands. The farthest left is your movement button. Choose your character and then mash B on this button to march that character to the right. Its speed is dependent on its stats and how fast you can mash. And watch the progress bar as the enemy does the same thing. It takes ages for the two to meet. Once you do, the other commands control your attacks. The regular attack is free, but the others will cost you points. You can perform jumping attacks that propel you forward, as well as faster ones that strike before the enemy can. Hope you didn't spend all your points buying a bunch of useless slimes on that first screen. This is part of the problem with the difficulty. The opponents seemingly are not governed by the same economy you are. They can just use the strong attacks over and over without recompense. Once your monster dies, you have to start again from your castle with the next one. Lose a character and they're gone permanently, leaving it highly likely that you'll find yourself in an unwinnable position. You can revert the game to the previous checkpoint using a password, but with the time it takes for these battles to play out, you might not want to. Combat is painfully inconsistent thanks to a really ropey hit detection. Attacks frequently just don't do anything, and there's no real way to tell the order in which the players move, taking yet another potential layer of RPG strategy out of the game. Battle of Kingdom tries to incorporate into itself several different genres, sadly none of them are really pulled off all that well, leaving an outcast of a game, looking mournfully through a window into several parties it wasn't invited to. It doesn't really belong anywhere. Hey, at least it looks nice. Don't lie to me, you absolutely wasted time at work or school playing this game. I know you did. Anyone who used a Windows computer between 1992 and 2005 is almost certainly aware of such an iconic part of the operating system. In case the free version wasn't enough for you, in 1991 you could opt to pay for a version that you could play on a machine that your teacher or boss would have confiscated if they found you playing on their time. Hey, not everyone had a PC in their homes in 1991. Maybe some people just really liked Minesweeper back then. For the inexplicably unaware, the aim of the game is to click on all the squares in a grid that do not have mines on them. Successfully do so, and you'll uncover a number from 1 to 8, indicating how many mines there are in adjacent or diagonally adjacent squares. A number at the top of the screen tells you how many mines there are, and if you know for sure that a square has a mine on it, you can mark it with a flag. You'll be able to figure it out in several ways. If you have, say, a number one that is only touching one unturned square, you'll know there is a mine there. If there are two unknowns next to a number two, likewise you know they're both mines. If you have some unturned squares next to a number three that already has three identified mines touching it, you know for sure that these are not mines and can be safely overturned. Basically, you have to overturn everything that is not a mine. Touch one square with a mine and it's game over. Large swathes of the board can be overturned if you click on a square that's not touching any mines. All connecting tiles that have zero mines will be revealed. For a flex, you can choose not to place the flags. You get bonus points for each flag you don't place once every non-mine tile has been uncovered. This is one of the easiest reviews I will write in this book. It gets a solid three stars, because it's as damn near perfect a representation of Minesweeper that you could ask for. It gets only three stars, because it's Minesweeper. This is about 50% game, 50% procrastination tool.
The second game in that trilogy of Japanese exclusive shoot 'em ups that I talked about with July's Battle Juice came in the form of the Darius 2 port, Sagaya. This was Taito's attempt at competing with great series like Gradius and R Type. Tell me though, how are you going to do that on the Game Boy if you don't release the games outside of Japan? That's a sore spot for me, but at least the system is region free, so I don't mind these days importing these sorts of titles. What little text there is in the game is all in English anyway. In Sagaya, you pilot a craft from left to right, blowing away everything that moves. It's set in space, but the antagonists are decidedly marine like in nature. You'll be fighting all sorts of fish, crustaceans, and the like, as well as the normal alien forms you'd expect. The non linearity of earlier Darius games that had branching paths and multiple endings was scrapped in favour of a much more straightforward route. There are eight levels to traverse, each with a boss at the end. You can choose various settings such as number of lives and difficulty, rapid fire, and even your preferred control scheme. One button shoots and one drops bombs, and it's up to you which way around to have them. At the bottom of the screen, there are three gauges that start off with M, B, and A next to them. The letters can change depending on the strength, each with four squares after them. These are your power up systems. Destroying certain enemies, they're in a different shade so are easily spotted, releases collectibles that increase these three characteristics. M is your main firepower. This starts as a single shot, doubling and then tripling up. You can then improve it to a spread shot and further on through lasers, a wave gun, and other such more powerful ammunition. B indicates the level of your bombs. You need to fill all four squares and then collect a fifth bomb power up to improve that, but it then fires a bomb upwards as well as down, so it's pretty useful. The third gauge is your armor. It's possible to collect this shield that encompasses your ship, and this allows you to take a few hits. If you manage to upgrade any of these three power ups to a new stage, i.e., where its designated letter changes, then you'll keep it for the rest of the game. However, if you die having only collected, say, three or four of a full set, then you'll be back down to zero. The bosses are excellently designed and have several weak spots each that you need to take out. For instance, there's a crab looking boss that you must destroy the pincers and face of, a coelacanth beast with two fins and a gaping maw to take out, and so on. Before each boss, a klaxon will go off and a really cool text box will come on screen saying something like, Warning, a huge battleship, Big Merman, is approaching fast. Then the music changes and the fight ensues. After that, a similar box appears saying something like, Fourth zone is over. We are now rushing into fifth zone. Be on your guard. The first three levels are doable, not easy for sure, but beatable. But stage four is where it really kicks up a notch. You have to make your way through a cavern, stopping at three places along the way to fight a rejuvenated version of the previous three bosses. They now have more health and different attack patterns, though, so don't think it'll be as easy as it was before. After that, you're still not done. You've got to fight this gigantic mola mola fish thing. Quite frightening, but looks awesome. Get to level 8, and the same concept applies. I hope by now you maxed out those wave guns. There's a brilliant aesthetic to the whole affair. Backgrounds are subtle but well detailed, and the top and bottom of the screen have a foreground layer to them that scrolls at a different speed to the rest of the play area. The effect of this is a really cool feeling of motion, even when travelling through an otherwise monotonous tunnel. The music is sublime all the way through, and not cliched either. It's balanced very well with the sound effects. You can't have a good shoot 'em up without a good pew pew sound, and sets a mid tempo pace consistent with the speed of scrolling in the game. A brilliantly presented game with tight controls and a difficulty just on the right side of brutal makes Sagaya not only one of the best shoot 'em ups on the whole system, but one of the best Japanese exclusives as well. Believe it or not, however, there's a game out there that bests Sagaya in both of those categories. You'll just have to wait until December 1992 to find out what I'm talking about.
Let's travel back to the land of Sagar for a final time, playing the fourth and last Final Fantasy monikered game on the Game Boy. They've all been phenomenal up to this point, from a technical as well as a storytelling standpoint. The story in Legend 3 is pretty cool as well. You can time travel in this one, which is always interesting to see how it's dealt with. You play as a guy called Arthur, a good strong hero's name, who was sent back to the present from the future to help destroy a creature called the Pure Land Water Entity that has engulfed the world in a great flood. You have to travel between the past, present and future to collect all the parts of your ship, the Talon, which will then help you defeat the entity. The gameplay is quite similar to the second game, the classes are the same. The monsters still need to eat meat to mutate into various forms, but now any mortal can eat the meat too, which alters their stats. The robot class from before has a similar mechanic now as well. When fighting mechanical enemies, they can sometimes drop robot parts, which you can install on your own characters to improve them. Actually, it doesn't just work for robots, you can create weird cyborg hybrids by bolting robot parts to your humans. Pretty wacky, but then that's JRPGs for you. I don't know if that was the original intention or whether the meat and parts were supposed to be class specific, but there it is. In a way, it can be quite frustrating, as anyone who's ever played one of these encounter-laden RPGs knows. After an annoying battle diversion, you tend to just rapidly mash the button until you're back on the overworld. Well, try to refrain from this, as it's all too easy to accidentally consume these parts when you might not want to. They don't always change you for the better. Remember, certain weapons and armor are only usable by certain classes. You don't want to get to a particularly tricky part and not be able to use that killer sword you've found. Just be careful and the game shouldn't get too out of hand. It's possible to jump on the overworld. Kind of strange to see that at first, but it lets you clear holes that often lead to dungeons. It also seems to reduce the number of random encounters out there, so is neat if you want to quickly progress or are backtracking. Your weapons don't wear out in this game, which, depending on your point of view, is good or bad. Sure, it saves you money and time, but that added element of realism was kind of a feature of the other two games that I didn't really mind. RPGs are often cheesable if you're prepared to work the grind enough, but this one is rather too easy. You can set your support characters, the other three in your party, to auto mode, similar to how you can in Dragon Quest games, and they'll use their own intuition and strengths to help you out. For instance, for my first run through I had a strong warrior type with a ton of attack power, auto attacking everything, a mage type who auto cast everything, and a guy dedicated entirely to healing spells. They do a pretty good job too, which makes grinding really quick as you don't have to go through the motions of healing or telling your companions what to do. Even easier than this, however, is a really dumb feature that allows you to speedily level up, consequence free. You can enter a simulation room right at the start of the game and fight monsters over and over again with no risk of wiping out yourself. There's an inn literally two buildings away. This would be fine to teach you the gameplay mechanics, but any leveling up that you incur sticks with you. It's the equivalent of hacking away at a man made of hay bales for 20 years until you're suddenly skilled enough to slay a dragon. Again, I don't know if this was intended or an oversight, but it's pretty dumb. Not only levels, but money too. You can easily earn all the money you'll ever need in the game in a couple of hours. There's not much more that's particularly negative about Final Fantasy Legend 3 though. I adore the storyline, it's such a captivating journey. Delightful little tidbits are scattered throughout, like the times when you meet an older version of a character that you met in an earlier time period. The graphics are as accomplished as the second game, and the sound is, of course, exquisite. I'm not a huge fan of the equipment screen, it can be a little hard to decipher at times, but it's functional enough. Take my advice and don't spend a whole lot of time on grinding, as it totally kills the challenge. As with all of the previous three Final Fantasy games on the Game Boy, not only is Legend 3 excellent, it's downright essential.
Like getting sand in your sandwich, I had something of a bad experience the last time I tried to play a Game Boy Beach Volleyball game. Malibu Beach Volleyball was the equivalent of a cricket ball to the gonads when you forgot to put on your codpiece. The memory of that mess doesn't detract from the great memories I have playing Super Spike V-Ball, though, so I'm totally prepared to give this another go. World Beach Volley 1992 GB Cup is a two-on-two -two game, but doesn't have to be all men versus all men, or even similar nationalities. Each of the six countries on offer, Japan, China, Australia, Brazil, USA, and USSR, have two male and two female characters to choose from, and you can completely mix and match gender and nationality. The descriptions of the players should really help you to choose your team, but they aren't really indicative of anything. They give the purported height and weight of the players, despite the fact that the only in-game difference is a gender one. The blurbs on the bottom are quite literally dictionary translations from the original Japanese, consisting of four or five words and are often unwittingly hilarious. The USSR male team consists of a guy who is the best bloker overhead quick, and one who is quick-footed and accurate toss work, whereas the Chinese female duo features one who is an excellent setter speddy toss work, and Lie, described as quick movement Chinese hope. After you select your players, you can adjust their abilities somewhat, to a maximum number of stat points, in the areas of power, technic, jump and run. Note that you don't have to allocate all the stat points. If you want to dock the computer players all their points, feel free to do so. Immediately upon starting the game, you notice a distinct improvement on the horrendous catastrophe that was Malibu Beach Volleyball. Having a CPU on your team helps no end. The two players don't have to move in tandem with each other anymore, and I can't stress how much this helps. The aspect is side-on, which is much better, but the depth of the court left and right is executed very well, and the course of the ball is easy to distinguish with an accurate hit detection. You set the ball, push it directly upwards in order to set up a smash, with B, and between you and your partner can do this a maximum of two times. After this, you can smash the ball with A, holding a direction to aim it. I strangely adore the Japanese-accented English speech synthesis. It's only ever in tiny snippets, but is very clear nonetheless. The voice is quite obvious when saying pray or alta and the like, but the sound quality is very good. Make no mistake, this is a Japanese-developed game, but it's oh so playable. Looks good, sounds good, plays excellently. The difficulty settings work, so you can bolster or handicap yourself as much as you want. World Beach Volley is actually pretty gosh darn good. We were kind of frightened of ninjas in Europe in the early 90s, I don't know why. They were all the rage everywhere else. What I knew as Shadow Warriors when I was younger is a marriage between two of the more renowned ninja-based franchises, Ninja Gaiden and Shadow of the Ninja. This game came about when Natsume intended to port Shadow of the Ninja, which Europeans knew as Blue Shadow. Confused yet? An NES title where you played as a hired assassin paid to free New York City from the grasp of a wicked dictator. The same story is present in this game, although rather than the pair of nameless killers you controlled on the NES, you're the more famous Ryu Hayabusa on a mission to defeat Emperor Garuda and his minions for the same cause, freeing the city. Other elements of Ninja Gaiden made their way into this game, so it really does feel like a definite copulation between the two franchises. Your main attack is a close-range whip of your sword, and many enemies die with one slash. 
You can't climb and spring from walls, unfortunately. A brilliant mechanic that Gaiden featured, and the only special attack you have is the fire wheel. But the symbols you collect in order to use this look the same. You do have a bionic commando-esque grappling hook called the Ninchaku, which was also featured later in Ninja Gaiden 3, which allows you to hang from and shimmy along certain rails above you. You activate it by holding up and pressing A, the jump button. It can feel a little stiff at times, but you'll get it. I had to practice somewhat to become proficient at it, as you have to be pressing up exactly, any movement left or right, and you'll do a somersault jump instead of activating the grapple hook. This led to some pretty cheap damage quite a few times, and was my only real frustration throughout. It's a little easier on the earlier Game Boys. I play with a backlit GBA, and while it's a wonderful thing, the D-pad can be a little wobbly at times. You can crouch, which helps to avoid attacks, especially these rocket launcher things, but you can't move while crouching, so it's not as useful as it could be. B attacks, and it's pretty rapid. You can wail on enemies really nicely, getting several hits in quick succession, which is excellent for fighting some of the very tricky bosses. The ring fire attack is pulled off by pushing up at the same time as attacking, and fires several rotating fireballs across the screen. They aren't as strong as you'd imagine, so don't help that much with the boss fights, but are good for clearing away several weaker enemies at once, or ones that are placed awkwardly. There are five stages, the game commencing on the streets of New York City, into laboratories and factories, even a subterranean base that you need to escape via a channel that has lava racing down after you. That part really got my anxiety up for sure. I love the boss fights. They're not super hard or anything, but always inventive. In particular, the big guy who has a miniature imp version of himself trying to hump your leg and slowing you down. It's a shame that you don't get the famous cutscenes in between levels, although there are short sequences of Ryu smiting whatever boss you just fought, and you do get some pretty badass storyboard parts at the start and end of the game. It's always nice to be rewarded with something like that when you've slogged your way through a tough mission, although the ending features Ryu walking away from a crumbling castle. Someone should have told him that's the wrong game. Graphically, though, this title is jaw-dropping, and I say that without hyperbole. Seriously, the mandible lowered a little bit when I first saw that backdrop of New York. Also, the animations of all the characters has so much effort put into them. The grunts don't just have a two or three frame running animation, but will do things like wave for backup. Flamethrower guys who will go through the motions of crouching before firing. Guys who pull up their shield if you're facing them face away and quickly turn and slash to beat these. All sorts of wonderful little details that take this already kick-ass game and make it beautiful as well. A particularly memorable part occurs on level 3, where Ryu clings to a hook and gets pulled upwards. The solid black silhouettes of the buildings and a helicopter with pale backgrounds replete with moving clouds looks like something out of a noir comic. A very clever use of the limited shading that makes me wonder why more artists didn't utilize that style. And you look at those windows on level 4 and tell me you really don't believe we're underwater now. Just brilliant. In the arena of brilliance, the soundtrack has to be commended. It's a sort of greatest hit set list from Ninja Gaiden games, but a new flair has been added to a lot of songs. All five levels have their own theme, and the boss music is really energetic. It's something I'd want in the background if I was a ninja and had to fight a 10-foot man with a machine gun. The final boss music, if you can make it that far, is even better. The sound effects are wonderful as well, fitting the futuristic atmosphere. Lovely rumblings and explosions, as well as lasers and clinks of metal on metal. What impresses most of all, however, is how two classic franchises can be combined to make a game that feels like its own thing and be outstanding to boot. It looks like a Gaiden game, of course it does, but it doesn't really play like that. Well, it sort of does, but there are plenty of elements that you wouldn't find in the NES trilogy or in the Shadow games. Ninja Gaiden Shadow may be a hybrid, but for me, it's most certainly its own unique entity.
Today is the cultural festival of New Inaka Junior High School. Finally, the Waku Waku Stamp Rally is about to begin. You play as Wapiko, wandering around her school trying to complete her stamp sheet. The headmaster has given you a card with 16 squares on it, and your job is to complete mini-games to earn stamps to fill this card. The types of games you play depend on who you meet. A fellow school child will challenge you to a first to three game of rock, paper, scissors. Beat him to get his stamp. Walking into some classrooms, you'll find a teacher. If you can uncover the numbers 1 to 25 in order from a board of overturned tiles within the time limit, you'll get her stamp. Find what looks like a rock on the ground and give it to a flying bird for another mark on your scorecard. A wandering cow wants a plate of curry. Pick it up and try to give it to the cow to be presented with an Amida-style minigame where you have to work out which route will allow you to give the cow its meal. There's one where you play a kind of Russian roulette with a bespectacled teacher. There is a row of five chickens at the top of the screen labelled one to five, and you're both stood underneath them. You take it in turns to see which one will birth an egg onto your head first. Win these games and you'll get a reward to mark on your card. Lose them and you actually lose some of your HP, which is a little sinister. Run out of health and you wake up in the school infirmary with a sore head and a few less stamps on the board. Yikes. There are a few other mini-games such as a version of Peg Solitaire and some other pairs games. When you complete the card, you take it to the headmaster and he resets it for you, meaning you can loop the game if you wish, but truthfully there's not all that much to sustain you. The puzzles, if you can call them that, are incredibly easy. Look, this game was clearly intended for younger children rather than this 30-something man-child, and I feel stupid for even mentioning the difficulty. Maybe you could pass the game to your 8-year-old nephew and see how he enjoys it. Although I fear the youth of today are much harder to keep entertained than the youth of 1991.